Good afternoon and Akwaba, Alafia, hello, assalamu alaikum, all of the various greetings that we may greet ourselves by. Uh, I'm Dr. James Conyers, Director of Africana Studies here at King University, and of course, uh, it's always my pleasure to welcome you to any of the programs that we have throughout the year, but especially uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to any of our forums that we have during African History Month. It's always important uh, during this period of time that we uh, have informative lectures, that we reflect, that we uh, look at what's going on in the world around us and hopefully change our behaviors and have a greater understanding of who we are and why we are and why we're here and where we're going and all of those things. Over the course of many, many years, we've had all of the luminaries that you might think uh, in the discipline of Africana studies or what we now call Afrology, uh, all of the great uh, scholars, including Dr. John Henry Clark, Yosef Benyekinen, Asa Hilliard, uh, uh, Joy DeGru, you name it. Uh, my sister, Dr. Marimba Ani, uh, everybody's been here over the course of time. And in fact, I'm happy to celebrate my uh, going on 27 years here at Kane University. So I've been here quite some time and I've got to see many of the developments. And I'm proud to say that uh, as of, I believe, three years ago, uh, the, Depart the Office of Africana Studies now has a Africana Studies minor. Uh, I'm not going to give you the history of that because we should have had a major by now, but uh, there's some things that came along uh, during my 26 years here that prevented us from doing that. But fortunately, we've been able to get the minor, and that's important to us. Uh, just a few announcements before I go forward. Uh, I want to mention to all of those uh, who are here today who weren't here yesterday that we do have another program tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have um, uh, Miss Marshall Lee Watson, who's the former head former president of the New York State Correction Officers Union, and she's going to be speaking to us about the prisons and so on and so forth. And then right after that, well, almost right after that, at 4 o'clock, we're going to have uh, a special jazz spoken word concert here uh, with a live band. Uh, we're going to have, it's a tribute to, uh, we always call this the, uh, the Jackie McLean African Heritage Jazz Concert, and it's a, a tribute to the great jazz legend Jackie McLean who helped to raise me and we're going to have his son here who I grew up with Renee McLean with his band and they're going to be performing here and if any of you have any poetry and you're daring enough we're at a certain portion of the program you can come up and do some poetry as long as it's positive and the band is going to back you up they're going to improvise it's been very successful over the last few years so we're going to do it again tomorrow and I'm even going to try to do something so uh, I hope I don't embarrass myself too much but I'm going to get up there and try to do something tomorrow one final announcement, well, two actually, just want everybody, you have it in your, your brochure there, that next year we're going back to South Africa. It's going to be the African Diaspora Travel Learn Program, and we're going to be traveling back to South Africa next year, uh, 2019. We haven't been to South Africa in about five years, and we're going to travel back. In the last few years, we've been spending a lot of time in Cuba. But we're going to be going back to uh, South Africa, and we'll have all of the information out soon. So if any of you wish to travel with us, it's going to be very economical. <coughs> wish to travel with us. Uh, we have your names on the sheets out there, and hopefully you put your email so we can contact you. And if you're interested, we'll send you any uh, information that we have about the trip. It'll be two weeks, basically. So and we have a great time. We cover the entire country. I have relatives living there. And uh, we meet all of the different people that have friends that are living there. So we're going to be all over the place. We're going to be from Joburg all the way down to Cape Town. So we're going to have a great time. And the scenic wonder alone is amazing. Just see that alone, Tabletop Mountain and other places, just wonderful. And finally, for those of you who are graduating, uh, make sure that you come to our office or go online and sign up for the African Heritage Graduation. That's a big event here at Kane University. We've been doing it now for 33 years. It actually began before I was here, but I've made some major changes and improvements to it, so it's quite different than what it was when I first came. And this year's guest speaker is going to be, last year we had uh, Sister Sonia Sanchez, and I'm sure you'll know her, the great poet. And we had her, she was my professor at Temple University, so I had to call her up and say, listen, come on here and do something for us. This year we're going to have uh, Sister Cheryl Wills. You see her, News One, Time Warner, and she's a great speaker. She'll be our guest speaker this year. So with that being said, let's get into the program and have our guest speaker come up. Our guest speaker today is brother. I should call him professor because that's what he really is in terms of knowledge. So let me just call him Professor DeLacy Davis. He's been with, here with us before. <clears throat> 
And he, we hope that even after today, he'll come back many, many, many more times because he's chock full of information, especially about law enforcement, but things in general. I mean, you've seen him on TV and like it is, and you've seen him all over the place. And, and so he's been here even before I was the director. Dr. Barbara Wheeler used to have him come, and, and the brother's active in, in everything, and he knows everybody, okay? I don't think there's anybody out there in the field of Africa, uh, Africology that he doesn't know so he knows just about everybody so uh, we respect him greatly so let me just give you a little bit of his extensive uh, biography just want to read a little bit of it because I'll be going on and on and on and on forever Sergeant DeLacy Davis Sergeant DeLacy Davis is a 20-year veteran veteran officer who retired from service in East Orange <laughs> excuse me East Orange New Jersey on June 1st 2006 he joined the East Orange, Public, uh, East Orange Police Department in 1986. DeLacy Davis has been an instructor at the Essex County Police Academy where he taught community policing, basic law enforcement, and the use of firearms. Davis is a New Jersey State Certified Firearms Instructor. He has served as the President and Vice President of the Police Benevolent Association Local Number 16 in East Orange, New Jersey. He has served as the executive director of the East Orange Police Athletic League from 1999 to 2006. In 1991, he founded the community-based organization Black Cops Against Police, uh, Police, Police Brutality, uh, better known as BCAP, which led to his nation, which led to his nation voice on police uh, and community matters. The organization has worked with countless victims of police violence across the USA as police reform, as a police reform advocate. The Lacey Davis graduated from Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, with a bachelor's of arts degree in English. He completed his master's of administrative science degree, MSA, MAS, at Fairleigh Dickinson University with a 4.0 grade point average in 2002. I mean, that's what summa. Man is a summa cum laude, so I mean, uh, again, uh, what can we, we can't ask for more. So with that being said, without further ado, pre please bring up and welcome our brother, DeLacy Davis. I wanna make a change for once in my life. In honor of the creator who creates all things great and small. In honor of my ancestors, not for some of their struggles of 1492, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 98. I cannot stand before you free of body and soul in these millennium years, 21, 8. In honor of my mother, my mother's mother's mother, my mother, my grandmother. In honor of my past master teachers and mentors, Howard Seeley, Chief Willie Smoot, Sister Roxanne Gregory. In honor of you, brothers and sisters, friends and family, some of the strongest black and Latina men and women I have ever known. I greet you in peace in the many tongues of our people. Assalamu alaikum, hotep, shalom, shalom, hetepo, alafia, ola. And as my young people say, what's up? What's up? Give yourselves a round of applause. Don't look so hard here, please. Thank you for coming out. I want to thank... Doc, of course, was not feeling a little under the weather today, but he's here and pushing through, so we commend you for that. Certainly, I want to acknowledge the Director of Public Safety here and his colleague um, here at the university. Thank you for coming out. And certainly all of our system partners, friends, colleagues, my staff, my interns, and those that are watching live on Facebook. Um, very quickly, I want to jump into it. It's, um, we're talking about reentry. We're talking about Lionel Tate. And, and I'm going to talk about how we get there uh, what happens with young people? In fact, last night, while I was trying to prepare for today, I figured I'd get into bed early about 9, 30, 10 o'clock and just watch TV, and I got a call from a parent or caregiver of a young person that was distraught, there was distress. She, all I could hear was that there's two people in the bedroom naked in her house and they're underage. Um, one of them is her nephew. The other one was a young lady who's the girlfriend who was a runaway, been missing for three days. I just had this conversation with the young man that if she contacts you, you should contact some adult that you trust so that we can get this resolved. Saving grace for him is that he's 17 and not 18. The problem is that she's 16 and not 18. And all he needed was his birthday to show up and they find her with him and he has a problem. 
And so I, something said, get in the car and just drive over. And I drove over and certainly, and they were so shook, they didn't even get dressed, right? So I had to tell them to get dressed because they were scared to death because the mother had lost her mind. She told them she was sending them out of her house by way of the second floor window. So we knew there was a problem and they were just, so could y'all put your clothes on? I mean, you gotta get dressed. And so it took the police about an hour to get there, but it certainly was the entree for this subject for me because the question is not whether or not young people are gonna do something wrong. They are. That's why they're young people. The question is what will happen to them for the choices that they make. And what we try to encourage young people to understand is that the decisions that you make today will impact your life 25 years from today. And they don't think that far ahead. In fact, some of them not even thinking about tomorrow. They're living in the moment. And there's all sorts of danger and pitfalls and problems and things that are just waiting to capture our young people. And it helps me introduce the Lionel Tate piece because folks have asked me, do you think you wasted your time working on Lionel Tate when he got in trouble several times after you worked with Lionel Tate? No. Because if I accept that premise that Lionel Tate was a waste, then we need to also accept the premise that some of us grown people who continually get in trouble are a waste. It would say that implicitly there's no redemptive value in another human being. Let me run through real quick your presenter. Doc already told you some of the bio, some of the things we've done. I think one of the things we're proud of is having worked with the government of Bermuda doing gang prevention intervention and repression. We spent a year on the ground there with a bunch of folks. Dr. Linworth Gunther I took on the ground. And, and when we went into Bermuda, for example, I went in there, I, I want to say 2004, 2006. And I remember sitting with the magistrate for lunch and, and, and um, uh, Randy Horton was at that time the Minister of Justice and he brought me onto the, onto the island, onto the rock as they call it. And he had me meet with everyone because we wanted to go and talk to everyone in the community before we talked about designing a plan. And I remember the magistrate looking me in the face and saying to me, young man, you seem to be talking about America. We don't have those problems here. And so I said, okay, and I just finished eating my lunch. So, you know, folk asked, well, what did you do? I said, nothing else. Because you can't, grandma said you could take a mule to the river, but you can't make them drink. Certainly, if I'm on your island from America, clearly you have a problem that has left America and arrived on your shores. But if you believe that you don't have that problem, then I just want to enjoy lunch and I'll see you in a few years when the problem is way out there. And it had gotten to be that point because people were in denial. So Bermuda was a good piece. I've done five years as a school principal of a charter school in Newark. Um, adoptive father of four, I think I'm proud of that. I have one birth child but four adoptive children. My adoptive children were children that nobody else wanted. They're from the streets of East Orange, streets of Newark. In fact, my daughter, Jarissa, we tell this story when we go out and speak to other foster parents, potential parents, and potential caregivers. And we talk about how she was in my PAL program. Her mom died when she was 12 years old. She's been in the foster care system since she was four years old, violently molested by a relative. And certainly she had a rough life. And I met her in the police department's police athletic league. And I put her in a boxing program because she liked to hit people. So, you know, and again, we got to have all sorts of solutions for people, right? So I said, well, what is her attitude like a social worker? Oh, well, she likes to hit people. When she gets angry, you can't confront her. I said, well, I got a program for her. What are you going to put her? I'm put her on the boxing team. And so usually when we put them on the boxing team, we don't let them get in the ring for at least two to three months. But we put her in the ring the same day. And I told my sergeant, when she gets up to the ring, make sure that somebody hits her. So put the headgear on her put the 16 ounce gloves on, the gloves were bigger than her, she was a size four, but she was strong and she liked to fight. And she tells the story and she goes, Dad, when that boy punched me in the face with that glove and I went straight back on the canvas, I didn't know what hit me. She said that it made me think about hitting other people. And that was exactly the concrete lesson we wanted her to learn. And so she's certainly done well and so have the other children in life. And you know, and as I tell people when they see on, so some, some people on Facebook see my daughter, the performer, the opera singer, Ayla, she's supposed to do well. The statistics say she's supposed to do well. Her mother went to college, graduated Seton Hall, became a registered nurse. Her father went to Drew, graduated, became a police officer, retired as a sergeant. The statistics say that those children are expected and should do well. They have great outcomes, generally speaking. But what happens to the children that don't have both parents? What happens to the children whose parents are amongst the working poor? What happens to the children who are struggling to survive? 
who speaks up for them, who fights for them, who makes a way for them. That's what we're going to talk about, some of that. Retired, got all of that, National Black Police Association, member of NAACP. And let me just say this, I don't like NAACPs, generally speaking. I work with the youth groups, but I joined the NAACP so I could talk about the NAACP, right? Like, you got to join a group. I'm going to tell you what um, Stokely Carmichael, as we know, was his birth name, would say to you, Kwame Torre. And I went to one of his last lectures. He says, every black and brown person should be in an organization, every one of us. And if it's a bad organization, make it better. And if you can't make it better, start your own. But you must belong to an organization because there's an organized effort afoot to get rid of you, even if you don't think so. So you got to organize and teach the children how to organize. One of the reasons that young people don't listen to old people because they don't like old people. I know some of you getting a little nervous in the room. Right? You said old people, who are we talking about? There's a difference between old people and elders, right? Let me make that distinction so I can get out of here safely. I know y'all know I'm retired, but I got the public safety director in the back room so I can escort me off the campus. I am not armed. I, I agree not to come with a gun or badge. I'm not talking about you. The difference between old people and elders is old people are just old and in the way. In fact, they wrote a song about the old people. Move, get off the way, get out the way, move, mm, right? That's the old people. Elders, so the shoe fit where, this grandma would say, elders, as they get older, they get wiser. Elders know to make way for young people. Elders know that you could tell a young person, but it's more inspiring to engage them in such a way that you give them an idea that they believe they thought. My, my mentor used to say, I will make you think you thought it, because he would plant the seed. Grandma would plant a seed, and you think, this is a great idea. And she's in the room laughing because it was her idea, and you think it's your idea. That's what elders do. Elders are wise. We give young people leadership. We give them power while they're young. I tell my young people all the time, folks say, well, the, the youth are the future. How could they be if you don't give them an opportunity to make decisions in the present? When do they learn? Who do they learn from? You got old folks in the way wanting to be there until they're on their last leg. Just let me run one more time. It ain't your turn yet. What do you mean run one more time? Power is not given, it's taken. Check. And I say this to you powerfully because young people gravitate toward power. They don't join gangs accidentally. They join gangs because they see power. They join gangs because they see protection. They join gangs because they see family. They join gangs because they get to eat. We come here on mealy mouth, bow down, scratching where we don't itch, Laughing when it's not funny, bent over, cow towing, biscuit sopping, watermelon eating, fried licking, boot licking, handkerchief head, Negroes, some of us. Some of us. The elders know better. Check. They just step back and say, let that young person have a shot. Every time I got an opportunity, it was an elder who gave me one. I started getting those opportunities at 23. They said, let that young man speak. Let, well, if he can't speak, teach him how to speak. He doesn't know what he's saying, then give him something to say. Write something for him to say, but you get out the way. I'm moving. Because what I want to do is get through this piece, and then I want to give it some time if there's some questions. How do we address the juvenile and the juvenile justice system who makes poor choices? The question is, do we try them as adults and lock them away for a long time? Well, some people would like to do that. In fact, the people that own the prisons that have been privatized, they'd love to do that. Why? Because when you own a prison, you need prisoners. And in some states, they got contracts to guarantee that they'll keep the capacity at 90% or higher or just get paid for the empty seat. Lionel Tate was in a prison at 14 years of age for adults. Okeechobee. I was scared walking in to go visit him, but I had to act strong, right? Act tough. Because he was a 14-year-old in here with adults. Do we create alternatives to incarceration? Well, I can tell you now, sitting on a local committee for the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiatives, around the state, there are some counties that are predominantly white and don't have any white children in the system. But they got black and brown kids in the system when it's 80% white. So somebody's diverting children out the system, just maybe not ours. They've got curbside justice. We got to chat at the side. Some, some cops adopt the kids right when they find them, right? At least I did. Right, I brought home four. My mother says some people bring home dogs and cats. You keep bringing home kids. What's the problem here, right? But we got to do something. Obviously, we can't adopt them all, but we got to do something 
to divert them out of the system that's eating them alive? And finally, do we get involved so that there's hope? The question you must ask yourself rhetorically and figuratively and factually is, are you a beam, a beacon of light and hope for a young person? And you don't have to answer for me. The proof is in the pudding. Do young people gravitate toward you? Hakeem Adabuti says you can tell the men in the village by their choice of words. You can tell the men in the village by the children that gravitate toward them, by the way they move with them, by the words that they use, by their body language. You can tell who the children admire. But if they run from you, then you need to rethink who you are. This young man I got to meet like that. That's Lionel Tate. He was 12 years of age, did a wrestling death, did a wrestling move, killed his cousin Tiffany Eunuch, six years of age. There are people on both sides of the argument. I won't pick a side. I'll simply tell you what my role was in making sure that we tried to get justice as best we could. Some people wanted to prosecute his mother, who's a sergeant in the military, also a state trooper in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I didn't know her at all. Kathleen Grosset Tate had no idea who she was. But a young man that I had arrested for drugs in East Orange was in a rehab down in Florida. Three days before Lionel was to be sentenced, he said, Miss, aren't you the mother to the kid that's been on TV? He said, yes. Well, I think there's a cop in New Jersey that can help you with your child. She said, help me do what? He said, I don't know, but you should call him. She said, what am I going to say? Tell him I told you to call him. And so I thank Mike Smith all the time because my experience on the streets as a police officer was not one of hating my community, but trying to do what was right to protect the boundaries of the community, but also respect the people as I had to do this job. And so who would think that a guy that was selling drugs, now using drugs, and now in rehab because of drugs, would then be the contact in Florida to send a mother to me? She called me that Monday, on, that Wednesday I was on a plane to Florida. That Thursday he was sentenced by Judge Lazarus to life without the possibility of parole. All hope gone. And some of our children don't have that hope at all. Who do they turn to? What role do you play? Let's take a look. They listen to the cops and get in the car. Look what happened to Freddie Gray. Yeah, and what if they make it all the way to the station? Mm -hmm. You remember Sandra Bland? And let's say they do make it to trial. Mm -hmm. You see where that gets us? Don't you get it, Bo? The system is rigged against us. Maybe it is, Dre. But I don't want to feel like my kids are living in a world that is so flawed that they can't have any hope. Oh, so you want to talk about hope, Bo? Obama ran on hope. Remember when he got elected? And, and, and we felt like maybe, just maybe, we got out of that bad place and made it to a good place. That, that the whole country was really ready to turn the corner. You remember that amazing feeling we had during the inauguration? I was sitting right next to you. And we were so proud. And we saw him get out of that limo and walk alongside of it and wave to that crowd. Tell me you weren't terrified when you saw that. Tell me you weren't worried that someone was going to snatch that hope away from us like they always do. That is the real world, Bo. And our children need to know that that's the world that they live in. Let's finish watching. Let's see what they're going to say next. So the question becomes, what do we say next? And I, I thought that was appropriate, right? That's where we were, Lionel Tate trying to figure out what do we do for this young person. I don't know him, don't know his mother, no reason to be invested in him, no reason to pay to go down to Florida to work for him. But we did. And so what we worked on was this reentry plan. And as you see, we put three components together, institution, structural reentry, and community reentry. On the left, the institution, we're talking about the classification, risk, treatment, and control and then moving him to a select facility. That was handled by the Department of Corrections. Then the structural reentry, the treatment plan, the change around the job, family, behavioral contract. That was done in the prison before he left, but we participated in that. 
because some of what I had to do was put the components together. Who were going to be the stakeholders in this community? Lionel had one year of house arrest. I need to help us understand what that feels like. Some of us can't stay home one weekend. <laughs> I'm not talking about you, right? I'm just talking about your cousins, right? We can't stay home one weekend. I mean, it's Friday, TGI Friday, got to get out, right? This kid's got to do 365 days in the house. And there was very clear restrictions. No entertainment, no fast food restaurants, couldn't go to a movie. He could do nothing that was fun. I don't know any grown people that could survive that. So I felt like the, the case was stacked against him. And he had 10 years of probation. I don't know grown people that could go 10 minutes without getting in trouble, running a red light, telling a little, like this little white lie. So he was in trouble from the beginning. And so I needed to find some entertainment for him in terms of activities. So we were able to find a Christian academy that his mother wanted him to go to, which was going to give some discipline and keep him in a safe, structured environment. I was okay with that. But then I wanted him to go. They have down there what they call PAL parks, Police Athletic League parks. They're like real big community parks with all sorts of activities there. And they do community service. And you only do 100 hours at a time there. And he had to do 1,000 hours. And I need to say this candidly. I couldn't get one black officer down there to help me with this kid. It was a white guy that I didn't know at all who ran the PAL park that was nearest him and said, listen, Davis, I'm going to help you. I'm only supposed to sign up a kid that's doing 100 hours, but I'll take him for his 1,000, but it'll be 10 times. <laughs> and he gave us access to the park so he could have recreation because otherwise he'd be stuck and jammed up. We were able to find psychologists and psychiatrists for treatment who looked like him, who would understand his plight. And his mother being a single mother, working a night shift, trying to raise this boy by herself. And then, of course, the community reintegration, surveillance, mentoring, outreach. So I got signed up as the mentor. Treatment in the community, we were able to do that. And then the drugs and all of that. Three phases, as we just talked about. This plan was designed based on the model for intensive aftercare to high-risk juveniles returning from detention. And that's what we were trying to do. And that was what I felt 2004, and that's what we still do. The approach, is the offender's release conditional or unconditional? It was conditional, and the conditions were so stringent. They were so stringent that I was trying to get him shipped out of Florida as soon as his last day of house arrest was done. And I'm happy to say that one of the colleagues of the commissioner then, Devin Brown, he was the Department of Corrections Commissioner, he agreed to accept his package where I could get him shipped from Florida to New Jersey. We were able to identify college that would allow him to go to a culinary arts school and I found a sponsor in the community to pay for it. I even found a owner of the IHOP, the first African-American, oh, the only African-American owned IHOP in Newark at the time, Talib, Talib Abdul Aziz, had just opened and he agreed that he would employ him and teach him to cook. So I knew he was going to be connected there. Tyler had grown up in the projects, was now living in South Orange in a 5,000 square foot home that he had built. So I knew he was in good hands there. And then I signed up for custody because his mother was in the military. One of the first things that some people did, they shipped her overseas knowing he was still home. So she was catching it there. We signed all the paperwork. And when he finished his year of house arrest, she could not bring herself to send him to me. Man, there's a human side to all of this. This is why I talk about what we do now to impact young people. There's a human side. She couldn't bring herself to send him. The other question was, is he an offender of a targeted population that the Department of Corrections is working with? Here were my stakeholders, law enforcement, clergy, family, friends, employers, and community members. Well, I just told you law enforcement wasn't very friendly, not the ones that looked like me. And I, at the time, as now, was a member of the National Black Police Association. So we have members around the country. But I need to talk about some of the scary Negro black police officers, scared to death because the struggle is real inside and outside of law enforcement. And because we don't have... I say the testicular fortitude, the courage, the temerity, the heart, the cojones to simply say I'm not man enough to do this. 
What we don't want to do is kill the messenger, which is why I spent 17 of my 20 years fighting my colleagues in East Orange, the blackest police department in the state of New Jersey, and I'm fighting black people every day. In fact, I would have liked to fight a racist white guy, but I had the black folks up front fighting for him. But as I learned from my mentors years ago, when they want one, they send one to get one. And then your brother, your sister in the corner, I'll get them for you, boss. And I'll take $2 less than the other guy. That is not to say that all black people are horrible inside of law enforcement, but what it is to say is that if they're not conscious black, Latino, white, and goodwill officers, then you got to rethink your relationship with them, period. Because the stakes are very high now. It's not accidental that we don't have a room full of young people in the room. It's not accidental that all the guys walking around here with their pants, their drawers showing, and their pants down on this campus, because I saw some should be in here, because the life they save may be their own. It's not accidental that black boys, even after they get onto college campuses, we're losing 10, 20, 30 percent of them before they could graduate the college campus. It's not accidental, because the problems that we got out there, they got here. We just hallucinating and walking around with our head in the sky, being bogus college campus rappers and fools, pretending that we got it going on. When in reality, as soon as you leave here, your world comes back to what it was before you got here. Waiting for you. Got a little cell over here with your name on it. It's not like we're coming to school and leaving here building businesses. It's not like we're saying, I'm going to join an organization. I don't care what organization. Because you need a student movement. In this country, change has always happened from young people upward. That's why I'm not surprised that Facebook and Apple and all these other people have designed something to keep you so programmed and addicted that we don't have to give you drugs. We give you your device. Fools walking around, a guy walked into me yesterday on the campus here, looking at the device, walking into me. I'm like, yeah, how did that feel? You know, I mean, I just stood there. I mean, I just stopped walking. Bam! I'm like, how was that? What the hell? We're addicted. I have to tell myself not to touch the phone. I'm walking around with two. I do. I, I zip one up in the bag. The other one I put on vibrating. I just don't feel it, right? I make sure it's not on me vibrating. I know because some people start getting old, something vibrate, right? You start getting excited, right? <laughs> You're like, woo! Like the Pillsbury Doughboy up in here. <laughs> <It's> like, <"Woo." laughs> but our children are out of the process, they're out of the game. My mentor, Dr. Howard Seeley, may God be pleased with him, used to say, the more you educate in America, the more you get educated away from your race. It's like our black men are scared to be black. I got Caucasians that are conscious, those that are, and then I got Latinos that don't know which way they're going to go. Trying to straddle a fence. You can't straddle. And I tell my, my Latino officers all the time, you got to pick a side. I know you're a couple of shades lighter than me, but you ain't a white dude. I know you checked white on the census, so we ain't got no money coming in because you over there. But they know who you are. <laughs> I just got to teach you. Hey, I got to keep it real and make it right. Because these are our children. The children are not quite as confused as we are. We got these things that have been constructed by man, whether it's race, whether it's class. It's a struggle. And our children see it, and we're walking around acting like it doesn't exist. And so they grow up believing it doesn't exist. And then when it smacks the hell out of them, when they have their Latino card taken, when they have their black card taken. I had a student three years ago interning with me, and she went down south into the deep south with her big cornbread eating looking boyfriend. And she talked about how horrible her experience was down south for her and her boyfriend. She is African American, at least in appearance, and he's Caucasian. She said the black people were horrible to them, the white people were horrible to them. I said, well, what did you think was happening? She said, I mean, they were, they were abusive to us. She presents as an African American female. Her mother's Caucasian, her father's black. She was raised as a white girl. She's darker than me. Hell, dude, what am I? Right? A ghost? Now, why do I raise that issue? Because she went down south confused. She lucky she didn't get killed. She lucky she wasn't like an Emmett Till, 1955. Allegedly whistling at a white girl at 14 years of age, and they destroy you. 
and disfigure you so badly that your mother has an open casket to remind America of what they've done to her child. Only for the woman to come forward now, 50 years later, say it wasn't true, he didn't do it. Well, that's a little late. So we have to be truth tellers. And we got to tell the truth like tomorrow's not coming. Because the lives of our children depend on it. They good and docile. They not motivated about anything. My girls just walking around looking cute. Fine as they want to be with bum looking guys. She got on her heels, pumps, look at everything popping. Bam, bam, bam. Hard done, bam. Nails done, bam. Eyelashes doing this. What the hell is that, right? I, mean, I can forgive it though, she, it's new to them. And, I'm like, what are those, right? And he got his drawers all the way out. Butt hanging out, got the nerve to have a name around the waistband on the drawers. Like we not gonna see the same name tomorrow on them same drawers you still got on. Like I ain't gonna notice. And then the ones that can't afford the designer dirty drawers are wearing Fruit of the Loom. And you know they had them on because the grape is holding his nose, the banana done jumped off, and the orange done turned green. What the hell? <laughs> we got to really get serious about saving young people. So I had to have stakeholders that believed in Lionel Tate. And the goal was certainly to maintain public safety because that was the conversation we need to have. When we designed the plan, we're sitting with Jeb Bush, who was the governor at the time, his representative for corrections. And so let me say this to you. We were with a delegation of 18 people. 15 of us had never met before. That's the other thing you have to remember. And this is how Facebook and other people have figured out how to addict us. We want likes. We want to be liked desperately. I got 1,000 likes, I got 2,000 likes. Or as I heard a young person say the other day, when I say something deep and nobody likes it, I get angry. What the hell was that? So you're not saying something deep because you want to have an impact on people. You're saying something deep because you want somebody to like your deepness. You in college? Yeah. Why? Like, just go get a job anywhere. Save the money. But you know, I'm often reminded that nowhere in history have I read where the slave master taught the slave how to be free. Nowhere in history have I read when it was illegal to read that all of a sudden all the slave masters said, we're going to teach them how to read so they can be better workers. In fact, my grandmother was born in 1901, died in 1982. Grandma was the youngest of 10 children. All her aunts and uncles were slaves, and grandma raised me. So when you wonder what turns this fire on for me, it was just grandma, my mother's mother. I'm the fifth generation of my family, the fifth. The first generation, Professor Gable Day, hit here in the mid-1800s. The fact that he was called professor means he was educated. We can't go back three generations, two, one. And in fact, one of the problems is that grandma don't even look like grandma. At least when my grandma was coming along, she looked like grandma. Now grandma got a thong on, the daughter got a thong on, the baby got a thong, thong on, we wonder why everybody's butt hanging out, right? Grandma 30 years old. She has no wisdom. She has no life experience. She can teach you nothing. The only thing she could pass on to you is a thong. Guess a couple of people got thongs on, right? They, they, they checkling hard back there, right? And grandpa ain't around. Not around. So yeah, we wanted them to understand we're gonna maintain public safety. I had to speak the language. I'm on a committee with 15 people, and up until then, I couldn't even get to the front to speak. Because they were blocking me out. Everybody wanted to be in front of the cameras. If you even look at the press, everybody's in front of the camera, boxing out. So I stayed in the back because I knew that they were going to get around to my, my expertise. And so the pastors were all up front, the men with the money and the dripping in diamonds and gold. You know, they was, they was dripping. The, the make it rain people was up front. All the folks were there. I remember we went out to eat one time, and Mike Smith was with me, stakeholder. And we're paying for lunch. 
and the guy that makes it rain, he's from Louisiana, he's going down the list on the receipt checking off who ate what. Uh, Mr. Delancey, I think yours was $17. I need your money. He's dripping. So I decided this was where I was going to fight now, right? So I said, well, can I just see, make sure that's what mine was? Because I knew Mike had no money. Mike was the guy that got me to the table. And I thought that was just so disrespectful. So I took it. It was a hundred something dollars. And I took it and dropped a hundred and something and walked out. Went to the bathroom because I figured if the guy could beat me, I didn't want to get beat up in front of everybody, right? Or at least we could fight in the bathroom or say I fell. And of course he came in because that's just what we do. That's the kind of battle we had to do for this kid. Where do you learn that? Who teaches it? We want cookie cutter reentry programs. There's no such animal. Every kid is different. I'm a school educator. I can tell you that everyone learns differently. What's your learning style? I'm a visual learner. I don't care how many times you talk to me. If I can't see it, I can't get it. I sit in class doing my doctoral study. My professor says, don't write it down. I'm going to give it to you on Blackboard. Well, Blackboard ain't in the room right now. Give me a live version of it. I need to write it down because I need to see it. So we told them, we'll maintain safety there. So they asked, well, who's going to design the reentry program? And all of a sudden, all the folks sitting in the front said, oh, we got Sergeant Davis from New Jersey back there. So I got to go from seat number 18 to seat number one. I got to sit up in the big house. Cheesy. Then we had to assure Lionel's accountability. I'm old school, right? What's old school mean, y'all? I got young people in the room. What is old school? It kind of quiet. What somebody said? Somebody, what'd you say? Say it again. Yes, right. Somebody said something them up. That's right. That's what old school is, right? We get butter from that duck. Even last night when I went to the young man's house that was caught in there with nothing on with this girl that was a runaway, I said, man, I was hoping you was going to be an exercise. I got my black leather gloves. I put on my deck on Nikes. I had my scully pulled down. I was wearing all black. I went there. I wasn't that dude in the suit you met. Hell, this is the hood. We're living is good if you could survive. I said, you wasn't getting out of here today. Right? You got you to code switch. That's what we always had to do. Black men wasn't acting like punks in the 40s, 50s, and 60s because they were punks. They were acting like punks because their mothers were conditioning them to survive. So you didn't look white men in the eyes. Grandma taught me that. You look down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Grandma came up during a time where she couldn't even walk on the same side of the street as white women. In fact, they were wearing petticoats. So she had to move to the side because the roads weren't always paved. And as the horses or the carriages were going through, the mud was splashing. And my grandma got run up out of the south. She got the whole family shipped north because she wouldn't bite her tongue. Miss Jones told her, move in. You know you're supposed to make way for me. Grandma says to Miss Jones, hey, Miss Jones, up with your petticoat, down with your drawers. Let me take a peek at your old Santa Claus. <laughs> I remember it like yesterday, right? I guess I got this stuff honestly, right? My grandmama's mouth and my mama's mouth was just bad. But just think, you'd get killed just for your tongue. So we needed Lionel to be accountable, old school style. We wanted to provide services with treatment and support. We did. We have five programmatic principles. Prepare Lionel for progressively increased responsibility and freedom in the community. That got us in trouble. Bonnie Kerness, who one of my colleagues back here knows, taught me everything I need to learn about prisons and advocacy and reentry. And the data said that he would probably have a blip on the radar in the first three to six months. In the first three months of him being free, he got in trouble. Broke curfew. Guess what I had to do? Get on a plane, fly back down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, go down and meet with Ms. Landway, who was at that time his probation officer, get us before the judge, get us before the prosecutor, and I'm falling on the sword. This is where now, this is where now tap dancing, scratching where you don't itch. <laughs> That's funny. I'm doing whatever I need to do to save his life. I'm not selling out anything, and I'm not going to Tom for anyone. But if I've got to save a child's life, not only will I Tom, I'll strategic Tom. I'll climb up on the table and sing old Negro spiritual if that's what I got to do for his freedom. Don't laugh at me, Sister Lucia. She back there like, whoa. Right? That's called strategic Tomming. 
See, the difference between my grandmother, who was a house Negro, and the house Negroes of today is that my grandmother never thought she was a family member. These Negroes think it's all in the family, like they didn't see the whole episode. Archie Bunker wasn't your friend. Some of them missed that. But the young people are like, who's Archie Bunker? Just think of your worst racist. Now, I didn't say your president, but just your worst one. And you know Archie Bunker. I'm just saying. <laughs> the second piece was facilitating Linus' community interaction and involvement. I told you how we did that. Then working with Lionel and the community supports, the, fam the family, the peers, the school, the employer, on quality needs for constructive interaction and successful community adjustment. These goals and principles are flexible and necessary elements that must be present for the planner and team members to successfully implement a reentry plan. And that's probably one of the problems that I find with some of the folks that are trying to design reentry is cookie cutter. That doesn't work. It's got to be case managed. It's got to be hands on. It's got to be in your face. It's got to be constant. It's got to be a checking in. You got to make it so damn uncomfortable. They look, all right, I just surrender. What you need me to do? Right? And I'm going to give you one example that some of us in this community have been working on on the same reentry plan that didn't work for Lionel. We made a few tweaks and changes. And most of the biggest change was location. And we got a great success story out of it. We developed new resources and supports where needed. And then we monitored and tested Lionel and the community on their ability to deal with each other productively. Lionel was failing the test every time he got with his friends. And I said to his mother, listen, if I were going to get him jammed up, I'd send a girl. So you got to realize that that's what we're dealing with. He's not the same kid that you sent to jail when he left us at 14. He's now 18, and you don't know what happened in prison. And he's not going to tell us what happened. And we shouldn't ask but we need to know that he's going to have those issues. So I ran through the institutional stuff. Phase two, the structured release. Talked about that. Reentry components. Food, shelter. The diet was important. What is he eating? Right? I've got a young man that I mentor now, and the first thing I said, don't drink, don't smoke. I just tell him, I just, tell him, just say no, right? Just go straight at it. Just say no, it gets you in trouble. And I go even further with my young people now. I tell them, don't make no babies. I don't care how good you think it is, don't make babies. I'm here to tell you, I got one birth child, four adopted kids. You always pay. You'll be paying till the cows come in. And if you're on parole or probation, if you're on parole and you make a baby and she gets mad because you made a baby with her, her, and him, and them, all you need to be is arrested to get violated. You don't have to be convicted. Just get arrested. They'll take care of you. So I had to tell them, don't do that. Extracurricular, I talked about it. Physical training, we talked about it. The counseling, we talked about it. Individual education plan, we wanted him committed to his own success. That became a struggle for Lionel because he was still in the same place with the same people doing the same thing. And we know that from the drug world, the treatment world. People, places, things. You want something different, you got to do something different. We know that from domestic violence, okay? The power. The power wheel, right? The honeymoon period, the explosion, the buildup, the something sets me off. I get beat up, you get beat up, and then we make up. I don't want nobody talking about no makeup love. Get that. Ain't no such thing as that. That's an oxymoron. Come on, it's really good when we're doing makeup. No, no, hell no, it's not good. You're getting programmed and confused. I have female interns in my office, and I tell them all the time, I said, if boo acts like this, that ain't your boo. He might be a ghost, but he ain't your boo. And these, they, some of them are grinning at me now, like, yeah, he tells us. Right? Because somebody's got to teach. We wanted Lionel's contract to make sure there were priorities, including probation, commitment levels, and identify the sanctions for noncompliance. We got in trouble three times. Three times. The community reintegration. Informal social controls, I told you, family, peers, I was a part of that group. Duration of intervention, critical to offender's outcome, process of change, 12 to 24 months. We knew that. We got in trouble at three months, six months, and nine months. We kept getting bumped there. Program was comprehensive. It was flexible. But guess what has to happen? 
your participant has to want to be successful. We know that children learn when four, four elements are present. When they're motivated to learn, when they know that you can do what you're asking them to do, when they see the benefits of what you're asking them to do, and ultimately when they're ready to do what you're asking them to do. That's the, that's the killer right there. That's the zinger. They're not ready. And the only thing that can have more influence over that person than you is boo. Grandma used to say it this way. It's panty power. Very powerful. Whoever controls the panties got the power. Grandma was, you know, Grandma didn't go to school, right? She had sixth grade education, but she was smart as a whip, right? <laughs> so we developed a plan, plan of responsibility, an apology to the victim, reparations, institutional treatment, community reintegration. The team was probation officers, the supervisor. We had the victim's family. They did not want to participate, so they were not involved, but she did sign off. The mother signed off for us to move forward, but she did not want to engage. The mo his mother, Kathleen Grosset Tate, was involved. Myself, as the family friend, we had an educator that came on board with us. We had the clergy. We had mental health folks, psychologists, community groups. It was the Miramar Police Athletic League that opened the doors on our case manager. And that was the plan. Any questions on the plan? Any questions on anything I just presented? Yes. So generally for us with this plan, we were looking at 12 to, 20, 12 to 24 months as a minimum because that was just generally in that ballpark, right? So I have a young person with me now who's around 15 months, 16 months, what month are we in? 17 months. I envision we're going to be there at least, well, at least for us ideally. And now let's start, we're not talking about money in terms of a program, right? This, we're not, I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about resources. I'm simply talking about us being invested. So I'm looking at least the length of the parole in my mind. Now, now I'm probably foolish, right? But they out for five years. I done signed up for five years. I asked myself someday. I'm like, damn, they heard me just ask how many months we on, right? So I know I'm in 17. But if my first 12 are any reflection of my last 48, I'm doing all right, and so is the team. But I would say at least we're looking at the two, three-year period, at least the length of the period of um, supervision. Because then you want to get them to a point where you're moving them toward automatic pilot. That's the goal. It doesn't always happen. So like for the children that I adopted, my, two of my children um, have mental health challenges and diagnosed. One is diagnosed bipolar schizoaffective, the one that's the fighter. So it depends on which person shows up. Right? She a size four. She fights you like a grown man and win. And she kicked me one time and cut me across the leg with the foot. I'm like, whoa. I talked to her yesterday. I was telling her I was coming to this president. She said, make sure you tell them about me, Daddy. I said, you know I'm going to tell them about you, honey. Absolutely. She checks in every week, takes her medication. She's living out of state, found her own medic medication monitoring program, found a program to pro provide supports, found transitional housing. She found it all for herself. But that was about us teaching her and preparing her. When my mother passed in 2012, she said she had been gone. She had been on the streets eight, nine months. She said, Daddy, can I come back home? I said, no. I was devastated. One, because my mother's all I had ever known, and my mother was my partner raising these children. But I knew that I had grown this young person as far as I could take her. And if she's going to have any more success, someone else had to pick up the rest of the ride. Because in the year that she was with me, she didn't grow. And that's the other thing we have to be honest about when we're working with young people. We have to be honest about what the limits are, what the ceilings are. When we hit plateaus, what are the barriers? Maybe you're not the one to get them to the next level. Maybe someone else can do it. I tell my staff all the time, I don't care who moves the family toward empowerment. It doesn't have to be me. Just because I'm the director don't mean, mean I'm smart. It just means I'm the director. <laughs> That's all it means. It means nothing else. Yes. I would still say 12 to 24 months. So the so question becomes, how long does it take to make change? And it's really based upon what we're trying to change. There's all sorts of theories and models around behavior, social learning, all of that good stuff that I had to read for one of my interns recently, right? And behavioral change. How do we make change? What are we trying? What behavior are we trying to change? And I think that drives the time period. So, for example, with my with my daughter that's um, diagnosed bipolar schizoaffective, she 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 was sexualized at four years of age. So she acted out sexually. When I talked to the young people last night that I was in the house with at midnight, I said to them, I said one time, I said every year, around May to June, she was going to disappear and be hanging upside down with four or five guys on top of her and don't know how she got there. One year they dropped off on my lawn naked. 
six guys in the car to just push out the car right on the street. Now, that was mortifying to me. That happened every year. So what we began to do was step back and look at the signs and what kind of behavior do we see leading up to whatever it is is triggering her at this point. Because she was being triggered. And she couldn't articulate it to us. Now she's okay. She's now 29 years of age. But it took us years to figure that out. And the way I could tell that she was getting ready to have an episode or break out or refuse to do her meds was that she'd stop doing her hair. She'd stop washing up. She didn't want to take a bath. She wouldn't clean the room. We start looking for the physical signs, if not the psychosocial ones, because there are indicators if we pay enough attention. Yes, sir. Yes. Good question. So for us, and thank you, Director. So in terms of following up with a young person, so some have very structured programs. Like we had with Lionel, um, Ms. Landway, we had a weekly check-in. Weekly check-in, we had to do urine, we had to do a whole host of things, and that's on the structural side, and that needs to be in place. So for example, the young people that I'm coaching now, they, they know they're giving urine randomly, and, and it needs to also be random. So you need to have those things that are structured where they know they got weekly check-ins and then you got random drop-ins. Whether it's at work, we're dropping in at the job, we're dropping in wherever you're supposed to be, we should be dropping in on you without you knowing we're coming because it keeps you honest. And there's got to be a consequence when we drop in and you're not where you're supposed to be, the way you're supposed to be. That's the piece of it. The, then you got to build out like we do with our organization, we call it a child family team, but the team of stakeholders. Everyone's got to take a piece of this so it's not wearing any one person down. Because that also happens. You get burnt out. Especially if we're talking about three, four, five years. Hell, who got that kind of time? I tell my staff all the time, I laugh at them because our model, we use zero to 12 months and the outside number is 18 months working with a family. And I tell them, I don't have 18 months to work with a family when I get them. Like, I'm not going to somebody's house at midnight 18 months from now. I'll be damned. I got to get them right now. So my window is shorter because I don't get paid for this, right? In fact, I was telling the guys in the back, when I got this job, I couldn't believe they paid people to do this. I'm like, y'all pay for this? Like, I've been doing this 25 years, me and Miss Sergeant Russell, for free. Hell, this is like a kid in a candy store. I get a check every two weeks? Yeah. Like, I paid to go see Lionel. I went down seven times. There was no budget. There was no funding to get me down to Florida. I was funding it. She was funding it. We did it out of our pockets. So you're right. The follow-up is critical. And then the question becomes, in building out your plan, what do you do if there's a crisis in the follow-up? What do we do? Like last night, the young lady that came, I had to call the police director in Newark. We had the captain on the phone, but she went directly to Beth Israel Hospital where they take children. So she could be tested soup to nuts. She didn't get the, the prostitute. They got someone on the, on the rape team there. They got someone from the prosecutor's office there. They got a whole team there at Beth. That's usually where they go around here in the state. With him, I didn't want him to go anywhere. And of course, his um, aunt wanted him out the house, the caregiver. She was hysterical. She said, he's not sleeping here tonight. I said, he has nowhere else to go. She said, take him with you. I said, I have nowhere for him. I got a little girl in my house. I can't take him to my house. She says, well, he's not sleeping here. So I spent hours, and that's some of, again, we got to work through this thing. You got to prepare everyone for it. It's not going to all be peaches and cream. It's not going to all go very, very well. There are going to be blips on the radar, and we got to be ready for them when they come. Check. So application of it. I'm going to run through this real quick, and then I'll be out of here. One day I went out with my boys to put in work and found myself in the justice system facing 30 years to life, Joseph Welch. Joseph Welch's journey, April 21st, 2005, four defendants went out to put in work. 2005, 19-year-old Joseph Welch was sentenced, to 20, sentenced at 21 years of age to 15 years. Prison release date, September 6, 2016, at the age of 30. Moved out of the county to a newly renovated home. Volunteered at the Family Support Organization in Union County. Union County Reentry Program, Job Training Program, and some people who are here, Kathy Waters is here now. We want to thank her always from the Reentry Program. That's right, give her a round of applause. Wave your hand, Kathy, so they see who you are. Right? That's important. Right? Embraced him, made sure that he was able to do some of the things, and I'm just applying the things you heard me talk about. He wanted to be a, a, a cook. So we got him into a culinary arts program. Tuition paid for the culinary arts program at the food bank. 
Hired date February 15th, 2017 at an upscale restaurant, way up there in the upper scales. Got a promotion October 15th, 2017, and that's that young man graduating from culinary arts, and that's Joseph Wells. Stand up so they can see who you are. Give him a round of applause. That's him there again. That's here, there. Now we got him out doing speaking engagements. That's right. The key components now, and I'm running through it quickly. For him, residency, parole, mentorship. I don't have to tell you who the mentor is, right? All right. Yeah, yeah, I, like, that's the one thing we got. We got to replicate me and her. Because his parole officer said as long as you're between Sergeant Russell, his mother, and Sergeant Davis, you can go anywhere in the state you want to go. Now, that was in less than the first year because he, he, he was clean every time. He was where he was supposed to be. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing, and they trust him. And he's a model citizen. I mean, my staff, my board, when I told him that I was going to bring him in to volunteer, like, you sure? He coming to do what? He going to volunteer at our office in the daytime with people? Yes, he's going to be there. Because what, what do we do? We talked about, as we talked about the design, you got to now model it for him. He's got to see it. Before he came home, I began to have conversations with him six months to a year before he came home, talking to him. Mother said to me, I want you to mentor my son. I said, only if he wants to be mentored. And one of the conversations I often have with him is, I recognize you're a grown man, you're 30, but I also want you to know that you left home. When you left here, we had beepers. Okay, now we got an iPhone. You don't even know what that is. In fact, you, you had a beeper with four lines on it. That was like, that was top shelf when he left us. Flip phones, right? Now we got iPhones and internet. So I needed him to understand. I respect that you're 30, but you better respect that I've been out here while you were there, right? So we got some things we could teach each other. And he trusted that. When we got ready to get dressed, I said, so what kind of clothes you want to wear? He said, I want to dress like you. I said, what does that mean? I want to go where you go. Well, I shop in a thrift shop. And so now he beats me to the thrift shop, right? Okay, you can go in and get you a $15 suit, some $10, $15, $20 shoes, and look great. A good-looking kid, right? And then community service. He gave back and continues to give back. You saw him at a podium. We call on him to come speak. We call on him to talk to other young people. We call on him to motivate other young people. you got to give back. That's what I meant by the organization, Kwame Torre, joining an organization. Because if you join the organization, you got to engage your community. And then you got to ask the question about Africa and her children. We are Africa's children, all of us including your Caucasian brothers and sisters. Nobody just, nobody told them. I've been to Italy a bunch of times, okay? They got a black Virgin Mary holding a black baby Jesus right there at the Vatican. Nobody tells them. The week before Christmas, they celebrate the Madonna Nero. That's black virgin, right? Holding a black baby Jesus. They got, I took pictures and snuck out the country with the pictures because they got places where you can't take the pictures. And everywhere I've been all over the world, I see a black virgin holding a black baby Jesus. So I'm convinced when I, well, first of all, I'm the lighter side of black anyway, right? So when I see white folks, they look like me anyway, right? Some of them, they were like, I thought you was white. Yeah, I think I might have been a little bit too. Because, I mean, you figure, we come here darker than a thousand beautiful midnights and produce a baby like me, light, bright, damn near white. Somebody putting cream in the coffee and loving it, and it's not just McDonald, right? <laughs> Right, ain't that the commercial? I'm loving it, right? I mean, somebody's loving it, right? But that's what the reality is. My mother had blondish red hair. So we, when we get caught up in these conversations, I'm clear we're family. And that means while, and this was, while we're talking about family, I want to be clear. I got relatives that have no blood running through their veins like me who are more relative than those who have the blood running through their veins. As the late, great Amos Wilson used to say, Okay, and he's a bunch of books, but um, one of the books, that I, one of the lectures I heard him talk about family, and there's three types of family. There's extended family, which is the grandparents. There is blended family, which is the Brady Bunch. Boy meets girl, girl got kids, boy got kids. But the strongest family bond is the amended family. That is people who have no familial bond in terms of bloodline who decide to embrace familial values and say we're going to be family and we behave like family. See, we used to have that coming from down there up north. Everybody was your cousin growing up. Everybody could whoop you growing up. Everybody, not everybody, everybody. We lost that. That's how we survived. My children know now, if I say that's your auntie, my daughter will put her head down. I say, oh, that's your auntie Carol. And people are like, why'd she do that? Because she know auntie Carol can whoop her. In fact, I'm be mad if auntie Carol don't whoop her. In fact, the only time I would get angry, I'm not one of the modern parents. Modern parents will fight you to the death if you discipline their children. 
You hit my child when I was at the charter school. Crazy parents show up at the school. Blam! Who did something to my baby? What the hell? I know one of y'all didn't touch my baby. Head turning and twisting. I know it. My baby would never lie to me. I said, the kid's five. What are you talking about? You don't want to be that parent. I tell anybody, all kids lie, then they tell the truth. And so, now somebody want to test that theory, right? Doc, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm full blown in theory right now, right? Somebody want to test me. Just anybody test me. Say, I don't believe that. Somebody. And especially somebody that's got a kid. Because I'm going to ask you, did you call your parent? I'm going to say, Mom, I'm getting ready to go practice. What day did you call? You didn't. You lied. I'm not doing anything. Guys and girls. My mother was angry with her colleagues one time because they were talking about somebody, somebody's daughter got caught in the car with a guy. And my mother was just, she was assigning that to that's what white women do growing up. My mother come home. We were in our 20s then. Them little nasty girls at my job, their daughters was doing blah, blah, blah in the car. I told them my sons are gentlemen. They weren't raised that they would never do anything in a car. That's so nasty. My mother said, would y'all do anything in a car? I said, we couldn't wait to get a car, <laughs> okay? And my point is, you know, my mother was all talking this old pump and stuff. No, we was looking for a car too. Couldn't afford a hotel, right? Because we get caught up in our own heads. So we did job training, we did monitoring. I'm still monitoring the solution. Remove the barriers to reentry, appropriately fund reentry programs, juvenile detention alternative initiatives, local committee, which we have, higher no job training. I do a job training for Beth Israel Hospital. It's a five-week program where we train young people who are unemployed between the ages of 18 and 60, and we get them employed. In fact, by the time they finish our program, we strip them down, rebuild them, and then we bring the employers to them. So that usually they have more jobs than we have people to fill the job. And then the family support organization where, of course, you can always volunteer with us. And then you. There's always something that you can do to make a difference for somebody's life and bring about a change. Michael Jackson said it best. You heard him in the beginning. He says, if you want to make the world a better place, start with the man or the woman in the mirror and just make that change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother DeLacy. Uh, at this particular point in time, we're going to allow uh, Brother DeLacy to take some questions, uh, feel those questions. If you have any, please raise your hands. I shouldn't, everybody should have a question, OK? So I'm going to let uh, Brother DeLacy take over at this particular point. So if you have any questions, we have a microphone here. I'll get it to you. Or you can come up if you want to and uh, ask your questions. Thank you, Brother. Any questions back there? All right. Look, look, make my easy night, right? Doc, Doc is looking for a question. Doc gonna, Doc gonna have a question for me. He got one right there. Bring the brother up. This one. Okay, there you go. Um, <clears throat> my question is, so how do you get, like, what's your connection to get younger people involved or younger people uh, motivated to kind of like understand some of the information that you're talking about? That's an excellent question, right? So I'm going to put some young people on the spot so y'all can get nervous real quick. I've got one, two, two, at least two young people that are here with me, and I'm going to let them answer. Jasmine, why don't you come up first? I'll let them say, what, what have I done in your life to get you motivated, to get you involved? I'll come to you, to get you involved, to get you engaged in this kind of stuff that we're talking about. And you can jump in any way you want, any, no wrong answer, but just the answer for the brother. Oh, um, hi, my name is Jasmine. I'm an intern at FSO, Family Support Organization of Union County. Um, well, having Mr. Davis one as a mentor, having him at the Family Support Organization is a perfect example. Um, I just want his resume, first off, so accomplished. Um, having more people in the community that ha are accomplished and letting young people see that is just an inspiration of itself. So if you yourself are building yourself and you actually take the time to go back is a great example for one thing, I believe. What made you want to, you know, what motivated you? Me personally, um, I wanted to see more people, 
well, for me as a black woman, I wanted to see more black women doing what I wanted to do. So in order for me to um, start that, I guess, I wanted to be the example that I wanted when I was little. I wanted to see people in social media, people in social work in general. Um, so I want to do that. So. Thank you, thank you. Give a round of applause. <coughs> Andrea, hey, I know you, I saved you for last. Go ahead, girl. Stand up. We're making <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Andrea Marabuto. I am a um, Rutgers master um, student, um, finishing up in May uh, for social work. And I've been interning with Family Support Organization now for almost two years. Um, so I had a unique um, circumstance. I, w I fought and advocated to go back um, as a master's student after I, I graduated with my bachelor's. And I fought really hard because um, I had the complete support as well as the mentoring formation to continue the passion, which is to actually work in reentry programs. Um, I had first um, mentoring based to be uh, first hand based uh, mentoring with Mr. Davis. So I had the opportunity, and I was blessed to have him teach me um, from his own mouth, and then trickle down effect to all of the other family support team and help me um, create the things that I wanted to create. Um, I had hands-on experience with families one-on-one. -on -one. I was able to go and mentor um, with other of the peer support partners and be able to, as a young person, to be there and support them as well. Um, also to give my knowledge as a social worker. Um, I had the opportunity um, which is my favorite, to create a female mentoring program for young women um, called Healing with Hope. Um, so thank you. So I had the opportunity with the support from Families uh, Support and Mr. Davis to create it, and it was based on self-esteem, girls uh, from ages 13 to 18, to understand what struggles and the you know anything that's really happening in their life and able to put that in place and with all the other helps of the other interns who and the support system of the team to continue doing that and there's been a lot of success with that and I continue to look forward to keep going with that thank you Andrea so <clears throat> and I want to I wanted them to answer you first because I think it's always great to have the folks that are benefiting doing the work tell you why they're engaged now from my vantage point I heard them both talk about opportunity um, they talked about being able to create what they believe. They talked about their dreams being supported. I think that's critical for young people. Uh, for example, in the summer we do male mentoring. So Andrea and another young lady, Jasmine, who's gone on and is now working in counseling, said to me, well, why do you have a male mentoring program and not a female program? And that was a fair question because we have a transparent environment. I said, because I don't have any females to run a female program. They said, well, you got all the peer support parties. I said, I paid them to do that. They can't do that. I'm running the male mentoring program. So they said, well, we'd like to run one. I said, well, design it and show me some ladies that are willing to support and oversee, and that's what Ms. Russ and Ms. Russell and others have been doing, and I'll support it. They're running third or third cohort? This is their third cohort, and this time it's a seven-week program, three hours a day on Saturday. First of all, what young people do you know want to give up their Saturday for three hours and commit for seven weeks to other young people? So I think that we don't, com we don't one, ask young people what they want to do. That's the question we ask. Two, we don't support what they want to do. Three, we don't put money behind what they want to do. And then finally, when they stumble, we kill them. And what we do is we let them stumble. We let them take, the, take their chances. Now, what I had to do is create support systems around them. So when I get each week when she's doing her agenda, it comes to me for approval, just like the rest of my staff. So it's not treated like, oh, this is a college kid over here, so she gets a pass. No, she's built into a system that's got a structure, and these are the expectations, and she has to meet them. When there's a problem, we all sit down like I do with any other employee, and we process it together. I, I think, and then on the other side with the young men, same thing. I mean, it's the same process. What do they want to do, how they want to do it? I had young men, I had Claudel Joseph, who was my first male intern to help me with the male mentoring program, and I always said to him, he said, Mr. Davis, I'm going to be better than you. Mr. Davis, I'm going to be better than you. I mean, that was his thing to me all the time. And I was fine with that because what he was saying was, I'm going to do what you want done and then some. And I supported that. Claudel just recently got a job. I was his reference for a job, a counseling position. I gave him high marks. 
because he has met the bar and then some. So I think in terms of getting the young people engaged, you have to first find out what they're interested in. Now, when they're not interested in things like this, for example, we have to give it to them in small doses. And that's what I think we've done. That's why, notice I went to Jasmine first, right? I went to Jasmine because she was a quiet one. She was my last intern into the program, got in late, but she too understands that I put them on the spot, but I also gave them a platform. That's the other, but give them the light. Let them go up front. Put them on the stage and support them on that stage, however they have to do it. So I knew of the two, Jasmine is my quieter speaker. I started with Jasmine, then I finished with Andrea. And if I had eight of them in the room, I'd have run, went around the room and I wouldn't have said anything. Great question, thank you. All right. He, the brother has it. Are there any other questions? Well, Brother DeLacy, thank you so much for coming. I mean, you, you said God. so much uh, and took me back a long way. I mean, and w if you listen to him very, very clearly, you know, what he was talking about are certain things that he mentioned Amos Wilson and other people, and I knew Amos Wilson very, 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 very well. He's talking about institution building. That's number one. He's talking about cultural misorientation. I mean, the way he talked about how we need, how our young people don't respond to us and how his grandmother and mother uh, back in the days, I can remember growing up in Harlem, where if you did something wrong, anybody in the neighborhood had the ability to come and say, Sugar, you know you're doing something wrong. And I remember what happened to me one day when I was about three years old. And, you know, when you're a kid, you don't know cuss words, really. You're just repeating what someone says. And me and these little kids on the block, 122nd Street and 7th Avenue, running around talking about, you know, son of a bitch and, you know, things that we heard. And so this lady's walking down the block, don't even live on the block, and rolled up on me and said, Sugar, you know, you know, back in those days, you even had respect for your elder sister. Don't let my elder sister hear it. That kind of thing. And I can remember my grandmother looking out the window and said, that's right, you tell him. I'm coming down here right now. That's what DeLacy is talking about. But institution building is one of the ways that we begin to combat cultural misorientation. When your children do not respect you, when you're afraid of them, that's cultural misorientation. And that's one of the things that Amos talked about uh, a lot. And one final story on Amos. My sister and I, Dr. Marimba Ani, back in, well, this was in the, I guess, the 70s, in Harlem, we had the African Heritage School. It was called AHAP, the African Heritage After School Program. And we brought in everybody to do that. And one time we didn't have a home for it. Sometime we were in Convent Avenue Baptist Church. Sometime we were all over the place. We didn't have a home for it. And since we were close with Amos Wilson, I don't know if you remember this, uh, DeLacy. Amos had that little bookstore on 125th Street, right over there down the street from the Apollo. Amos allowed us to use the back room of that bookstore for the African Heritage School rent-free for two years. That's who Amos Wilson was. All right. So everybody should pick up a book by Amos Wilson, Black on Black Violence, Blueprint for Black, what, whatever Amos did, pick up a book by Amos because it's not enough just to talk, you got to also read. And everything that DeLacy said today, by and large, I said at the flag, I mean at the clock tower two weeks ago. All right. And so again, this is foundational issues in order to inspire our young people to understand the importance. This, is, this will enhance their life, not only their life experience, but their life expectations. And so again, we have to be able to do that. And with Brother DeLacy out there, when I hear him talk, it makes me feel like what I do is important. So thank you so much, Brother DeLacy. Thank you all for coming out. I hope you'll come out tomorrow. Marshall Lee Watson, the, head, the former head of the New York State Correction Officers Union, the Black Union. And then right after that, we're going to have uh, Renee McLean and his band here. We're going to have a fantastic jazz concert at 4 o'clock, so it's not late in the, in the day. You can come out. And as I said earlier, if you have any poetry that you feel daring enough to get up on the stage and do, the band is going to back you up, okay? They're going to improvise behind you. Now, we have one final thing before we uh, leave here today, and this is our tradition. We're going to have DeLacy come up. We're going to have everybody up who wants to come up on the stage, and we're going to take our Africana Studies group picture for our archive. So everybody that comes and speaks for us, we take the picture. So all of you who want to be in that picture, please come up on the stage with DeLacy. Carol, please come up. And everybody come up on the stage. Uh, Sarah, if you're going to hang around a minute, would you come up? Sarah? Oh, okay. <laughs>